Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the national anthem performed by the university singers. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. The Executive Vice President and Provost of the University. Mr. Rector, Governor McDonnell, members of the Board of Visitors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. What a glorious day. Please join me in expressing thanks to the University of Virginia Band for the processional music, the University Singers for performing the National Anthem, 
and the Army, Navy, and Air Force ROTC students who presented the colors. <laughs> On October 6, 1817, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe laid the cornerstone for Pavilion 7, the first building of the University of Virginia. Today, nearly 200 years later, we gather near the site of that historic event to celebrate another milestone in the university's history. Today, we install the university's eighth president, Teresa Sullivan. Gathered with us today for this important occasion are persons and groups of special distinction. As I call your name or the group, please stand and remain standing, and please hold your applause until the end. David Pryor, Chancellor of the University of Virginia College at Wise. Frank Friedman, President of Piedmont Virginia Community College. The Presidents of other colleges and universities. Representatives from universities and colleges, learned societies, higher education associations, and honor societies. Members of the University of Michigan's Board of Regents executive officers of the University of Michigan, federal, state, and local government officials, members of the University's Board of Visitors, University of Virginia Vice Presidents, University of Virginia Deans, Robert O'Neill, the sixth president of the university, Karen Wood, a Ford Fellow and PhD candidate in anthropology, is representing the Monacan Nation, the Virginia, Herit the Virginia Indian Heritage Program of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and the university's American Indian Student Union. In the audience today are two other representatives of the tribes in Virginia, Chief, Ken Chief, Chief Kenneth Branham of the Monacan Indian Nation, and Assistant Chief Wayne Adkins of the Chickahominy Indian Tribe. Chief Adkins is an alumnus of this university. Please join me in applauding these persons and groups. Please be seated. Today we have representatives bringing special greetings to President Sullivan, from five groups associated with the university. The faculty, the staff, the students, our alumni, and parents of our students. First, the faculty representative, Gwyneth West, the chair of the faculty senate. <clears throat> President Sullivan, on behalf of the University of Virginia faculty, I welcome you to the university and wish you well as you begin your term as president. The faculty takes great pride in our strong commitment to teaching, research, and service for the public good. We admire your commitment to supporting and strengthening teaching and learning, and we look forward to working on alongside you in the years ahead. The staff representative, Candace Wills, a grants administrative specialist in the School of Medicine. President Sullivan, on behalf of the staff of the University of Virginia, I bring warm wishes for great success and productivity during your term as president. The staff members are committed to providing strong support for the university's core missions of teaching, research, service, and health care. We look forward to working with you to sustain and strengthen the university under your leadership. <clears throat> the student representative, Daniel Morrison, the president of the student council. President Sullivan, 
On behalf of the students of the University of Virginia, I'd like to express our great enthusiasm and our excitement for your term as president. We are fortunate to have a tireless leader who can match the energy of a diverse and student body and who is willing to engage us wherever we are. This is truly unique and remarkable in higher education. And we know that you will touch the lives of the thousands of students who study here every single day and the thousands more to come. The alumni representative, Alan Roberts, Chair of the University of Virginia Alumni Association Board of Managers. President, President Sullivan, representing some 200,000 UVA alumni from all over the world, it is my great honor to greet and welcome you to Mr. Jefferson's University. The many alumni who have met and learned about you in the recent months are truly pleased and enthusiastic about your arrival. We, the alumni, wish you every success and happiness as you lead this great community forward in the coming years. <clears throat> The parent representatives, Colonel Martin Burks and Deborah Burks, members of the UVA Families Board. President Sullivan, on behalf of the parents of University of Virginia students from all across the nation and all over the world, we welcome you to the university. As parents, we have entrusted our greatest treasures to this university, our sons, and our daughters. We have done so with confidence in your abilities as a leader and with optimism for the great things that our students will accomplish at this university. Today we extend our best wishes for your term as president and we look forward to watching our sons and daughters thrive here under your capable leadership. The Testament of Freedom was written in 1943 for the bicentennial of Mr. Jefferson's birth by Randall Thompson, then chair of the university's music department. The text, which can be found in your program, is taken from Mr. Jefferson's writings. The university singers, under the direction of Michael Sloan, will perform the first movement from a summary view of the rights of British America.
the rector of the university. It is my honor to introduce the 71st governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a man of great integrity who looks for common good, who has moved boldly to enhance our Commonwealth's position in the areas of higher education, government reform, job creation, and transportation. He is committed to continuous improvement in the efficiency and effectiveness of government services and the economic competitiveness of our state and its regions. Most importantly to many of us, he has made higher education a top priority. And while faced with large cuts in many areas to balance the budget, he secured $100 million of new funds for our universities and colleges and has challenged all of us to produce an increased 100,000 college graduates over the next decade and to further innovate with more focus on science, technology, engineering, and math the father of twin sons who are first year students here, he is part of the university family. It is my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Robert F. McDonald. Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rector Wynn and Vice Rector Dragas, all the members of the Board of Visitors, faculty, staff, family members, friends, and those that are admirers of Dr. Teresa Sullivan. It's an honor for me to be here with you today in this historic day in the life of Mr. Jefferson's University. Now, I was noticing how this is only the eighth inauguration we've had of a president at the University of Virginia. And I'm the 71st governor of Virginia, so there must be much more job security here at UVA than there is in <laughs> Richmond. Uh, Madam President, I also noticed that uh, on Mr. Jefferson's tombstone that he mentioned only three things, author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, and founder of the University of Virginia. So I was wondering, since he was the second governor of Virginia, if you might not want to add that to his tombstone as a favor to me while I'm here. Well, as uh, W was nice enough to mention, while I'm not a graduate of the university myself, I do feel part of the university family during my 20 years in public service, and most importantly, with uh, my twin sons now being first-year students here. Uh, I have to say, uh, they've been here now for about eight months. I'm on a need-to-know basis, so I don't hear from them a lot. But uh, I'm going to see them play soccer here in about an hour, and I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today. I think it's a, a very interesting tradition here at the University of Virginia where you start the job and then 10 months later you're inaugurated. So congratulations, Teresa, you've passed the test. Uh, this is a uh, marvelous day at the University of uh, Virginia for so many reasons. It's hard to believe uh, nearly 200 years ago when Mr. Jefferson gave life to this place through his dream and his vision that could he have possibly imagined how grand the dream would be here in 2011 and to see us at this inauguration of the first woman president of this university. Not, but I think much more than the fact that she's historic in that regard, I think that it is important because of the experience the knowledge and the passion that Dr. Sullivan has demonstrated through more than three decades of service in higher education that makes her uniquely qualified for this time in UVA history to be president. Over these last uh, couple of months uh, that I've been governor and she's been president, I've had the honor of getting to know her both personally and professionally, and have been most impressed by her leadership and what she has offered to the service of the young people of this country. Her energy and her drive to build upon this 200-year legacy of the University of Virginia has created a marvelous environment where students are free to succeed and live the American dream. As I mentioned during her time uh, in 30 years in higher education, she has done a lot. She's been a sociologist. She's been a professor. She's been a dean. 
She has done research and has formed specialties in economics and debt, which I think qualifies her uniquely to advise the United States Congress at this point in American history. I think it takes a strong and gifted leader to follow on the incredible 20 years of service of Dr. John Castine, but I want to commend the rector and the vice rector and the board for choosing wisely, as you have done with Dr. Terry Sullivan. As uh, Dubby did in giving my entire speech in 30 seconds, I wanted to tell you that uh, I view advancement in creating new opportunities in higher education to be one of the top goals of our administration. During this uh, six to eight months of reform, Dr. Sullivan has already proven to be an incredibly capable and energetic leader for these reforms in helping us to meet these goals. Like so many of you growing up, I remember the TV commercials and my dad telling me to get a good job, you need a good education. It's more true today in this globally competitive, specialized society than perhaps any other time. The job does in fact create the sense of fulfillment. It does in fact create the ability to earn the income to keep people enabled to support their families, and it creates the access to the American dream. So we believe, and with Dr. Sullivan's leadership, that it is so important to connect higher education and economic development so that we graduate young people that are ready for the great jobs of the 21st century. The goal is, in fact, 100,000 new degrees over these next uh, 15 years to focus on science and technology, engineering, math, healthcare, business, and those things that will foster innovation. One of the goals we set uh, during this time, of course, is to quickly expand access to the great institutions of Virginia. I want to commend Dr. Sullivan. She was the first college president in Virginia to step forth and to meet that challenge, announcing that the University of Virginia over the next five years would admit 1,500 new students. And I thank you for your leadership because it's now caught on in our other universities. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. During this upcoming year, I understand UVA has sent out acceptance letters now to 7,750 high school seniors, 538 more than last year. Dr. Sullivan has hosted one of the Higher Education Reform Commission meetings right here on the grounds at the University of Virginia. She was the first one to step forward and say we need to rethink how we deliver degrees in the Commonwealth, coming up with an innovative four-year degree program, three-year undergraduate and a fourth-year master program to find ways to get our young people through this higher education institution quicker with more qualifi qualified degrees. She was at the forefront of forming an innovative partnership with James Madison, Virginia Tech, and George Mason together with Cisco to be able to use advanced technologies in everything from distance education in research and development here in Virginia. Her leadership in the Virginia higher education system is indispensable. And so two weeks ago, we passed legislation at my request uh, to further the Higher Education Commission's work in Virginia by creating a Higher Education Advisory Council that will directly advise the, pre the governor and our cabinet about the next steps to take in higher education. And I'm pleased to announce today that under the language in that bill that I intend to appoint Dr. Teresa Sullivan as one of the members of that Higher Education Advisory Commission to continue to lead us in the future. We must continue to invest in our higher education institutions to see them grow, but to do it in new and innovative ways. In addition to investments in academics, we have to invest in the bricks and mortar that are still necessary to advance this institution. And I was delighted two weeks ago that the General Assembly, at my request, appropriated two and a half million dollars so that we can do the refurbishing that's necessary in your cherished rotunda. Uh, the last two days I spent in New York and spent a lot of time with very successful University of Virginia graduates who are doing great work on Wall Street, earning money so they can write checks back to the university, which I encourage them to do in greater numbers, 
uh, but also being very benevolent, not only in Virginia, but in fact around the country. And through my discussions to a person, they were all excited and thrilled with the new vision and leadership and the things that are happening here at the University of Virginia because of this day of inauguration for Dr. Teresa Sullivan. So I'm here to say uh, Godspeed, Dr. Sullivan. We are excited about your leadership. Uh, we know that you are going to do uh, enormously great things here uh, for Mr. Jefferson's university. We know that uh, the young hearts and minds that walk through this place uh, during their years that are here uh, will be those leaders that will keep America the great and exceptional nation that it is today. And with your leadership, many new generations of accomplished Virginians will walk away from this place. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor McDonald. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Mary Sue Coleman is the 13th president of the University of Michigan. She has been a strong advocate of the contributions, creativity, and innovation of the University of Michigan students, as well as faculty, alumni, and others in a knowledge-based economy. As president, she's committed herself to heightening the university's role in economic development, particularly in Michigan and in the Midwest. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gary Locke recognized President Coleman's efforts by appointing her co-chair of the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Time Magazine has named her one of the top 10 college presidents in the country. As president, she appointed Teresa Sullivan as Michigan's Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. And, like Ms. Sullivan, she is the first woman to lead her university. Please join me in wel welcoming President Mary Sue Coleman. Governor McDonald, Rector Wen, and members of the Board of Visitors, President Sullivan and Professor Laycock, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends of the University of Virginia. Today, together, we make history in shaping the future of this distinguished university. It is my distinct and personal pleasure to welcome Terry Sullivan to the university presidency and to join in celebrating her inauguration as the eighth president of the University of Virginia. Rector Wynn, you and your fellow board members made an exceptional decision in selecting this president to lead Mr. Jefferson's university. My only hesitation in praising your choice is that you deprived the University of Michigan of a much admired and accomplished leader. It was Mr. Jefferson who once observed, the appointment of a woman to office is an innovation for which the public is not prepared, nor am I. I believe Terry Sullivan would convince him otherwise. She is simply that impressive. <laughs> and today, more than ever, the great American institution we know as the public university demands strong, effective leadership. We need creativity, tenacity, and integrity in the face of declining state funding and tenuous public support. Terry's depth of knowledge infuses her with a calmness that conveys both confidence and experience, particularly in the face of chaos and pressure. She does not fluster easily, if ever. Credit that to her tenure as a faculty member, department chair, dean, and provost she has seen it all. Most important, she has a sense of humor and a wicked one at that. <laughs> As my fellow presidents here today well know, this job can make you laugh or cry, and I prefer laughter. Terry does too. All of these essential attributes 
allowed those around Terry to genuinely enjoy her leadership. I am pleased, but not surprised, that a large contingent of University of Michigan leaders joined me in traveling to Charlottesville. We deeply admire Terry, and we miss her. Teresa Sullivan's appointment as president extends a deep relationship between the University of Virginia and the University of Michigan. It is a bond that stretches back in time when our respective institutions were nation ideas in the minds of two men. For Thomas Jefferson founded this great university, a jurist by the name of Augustus Woodward conceived what was first known as the University of Michigania. South and east of here, in the splendid rooms of Monticello, Jefferson and Woodward exchanged stories and ideas. Historians agree the two men were friends, united in their passion about the necessity of public education in the new republic. They were inquisitive about science and the natural world. They believed that human knowledge could and should be cataloged and classified. Most significantly, they understood that democracy demanded an educated citizenry. As president, Mr. Jefferson appointed his friend to be the first chief justice of the Michigan Territory, a largely untamed area. To appreciate Mr. Jefferson's influence, know that Judge Woodward purchased some 500 acres outside Detroit and called his new estate Monticello. But the more lasting product of their friendship was the University of Michigan, and we in Ann Arbor are indebted to the conversations that first took place in the hills of Charlottesville. Michigan was established in 1817, followed two years later by Virginia. Each had humble starts. For years, both universities operated without presidents for fear that too much power would be placed in one person. Sadly for the faculty, presidents have been a staple at Virginia and Michigan for over a century now. <laughs> in truth, our respective institutions have had exceptional leaders who along with faculty and students have elevated Virginia and Michigan to the pinnacle of public higher education. Ours are exceptional universities recognized worldwide. We are strong in research, committed to diverse ideas and people, and dedicated to public service. Academic excellence is the norm. And whether Wahoos or Wolverines, we love our sports teams. Most important, we have never wavered in our commitment to society. At Michigan, we are driven by the ethos of providing an uncommon education for the common man. It is a sentiment preached by Jefferson, who ardently believed in the power of education, an education for all, from the richest to the poorest. Public universities have a compact with society, and especially the citizens of our states, to work on their behalf and promote the greater good. It is an obligation we are privileged to fulfill. Thomas Jefferson wanted this university to be, quote, worth patronizing with the public support and be a temptation to the youth of other states to come and drink of the cup of knowledge and fraternize with us. Listen to his words again, worth patronizing with the public support. American higher education, particularly public edu higher education, is one of the monumental achievements of our country. No other nation can rival the innovation, creativity, and intellectual fervor of American universities, none. But we are threatened, threatened by shrinking financial support from our federal and state governments, and threatened by waning public confidence in those skeptical of our value and contributions. Some might even question why anyone would want to lead a university in 2011. Too little money, too many headaches, too
too few rewards. One of this university's most notable graduates was Robert F. Kennedy, who lived and died during one of our country's most turbulent decades. All of us might wish at times that we lived in a more tranquil world, he said, but we don't. And if our times are difficult and perplexing, so are they challenging and filled with opportunity. Filled with opportunity. This is our opportunity to demonstrate just how essential higher education is to the prosperity and productivity, not only of the United States, but also worldwide. We are proud to educate young people, knowing their critical thinking skills will transform communities from America to Zambia. This is our opportunity for new therapies and revolutionary inventions, for creativity in the arts and humanities, and for redefining the boundaries of human knowledge. To paraphrase Mr. Jefferson, it is a time for innovations for which the public is not prepared. And this is our opportunity for strong, articulate leaders such as Terry Sullivan. The University of Virginia is a jewel, and this new president will protect it, make it shine, and increase its value. She is an exceptional leader for an exceptional institution at an exceptional time. A few weeks ago, Condoleezza Rice spoke at the University of Michigan. As Secretary of State, she held the job first occupied by Thomas Jefferson. Like Terry Sullivan, she was a university provost. She is a woman who has traveled the world, meeting with kings, prime ministers, and presidents, serving as this country's chief diplomat. And yet, when someone asked her about the best job she's ever had, she did not hesitate. It was being provost, she said, because there is no more exciting or important place than a university. Mr. Jefferson felt similarly. Up at Monticello, his tombstone says nothing about having been president of the United States. But the stone does proclaim, as he wished, that he was father of the University of Virginia. We are gathered here today because of a shared belief in the good of higher education and the infinite power of an idea this is not the first time we have faced difficult economic times. We can all point to challenging eras of dwindling resources. And yet we persevere because our mission is so profound. Clark Kerr, who did so much to define public higher education in the latter half of the 20th century, rightly observed, as society goes, so goes the university. But also, as the university goes, so does society. The progress of knowledge remains so central to the progress of civilization. Nearly two centuries ago, two men sat together at Monticello and envisioned great public universities. Today, we assemble on the lawn to celebrate the reality of those dreams and the certainty of an exciting new leader, a leader perfect for the opportunities that await Virginia and all of higher education. Thank you. Thank you, President Coleman. Clearly, if Mr. Jefferson had met the two of you, the statement might be different. I now have the pleasure of introducing a musical journey for President Sullivan, arranged by Larry Clark and performed by members of the University of Virginia Band under the direction of Bill Peace. This is the premier performance of this special music piece. In the arrangement, you will hear songs derived from the universities where President Sullivan served prior to coming to the University of Virginia. You will also hear musical ex excerpts that depict her new home here in Charlottesville. Ladies and gentlemen, the University of Virginia Band.
the rector of the university. Governor McDonnell, honored guests, friends, and members of the university family. It is my great honor as rector to represent the Board of Visitors on this historic and joyful occasion, the inauguration of Teresa Ann Sullivan as the eighth president of the University of Virginia. The university is fortunate indeed to have been led by many, many great folks, and most recently by John Castine, our immediate past president, who served with great distinction for over 20 years. Now we turn to a new president. In an era of increasing complexity and immense change in higher education, where vision, wisdom, and leadership skill will be even more important in determining the extent of our achievement. With the thoughtful advice of many representing all aspects of the university and higher education from around the country, the Special Committee on the Nomination of a President and ultimately the Board of Visitors carefully develop the criteria desired in a new president. We sought in the next president a person who could understand and embrace our past and the legacy Thomas Jefferson bestowed upon this great institution. A legacy that emphasizes the importance of a broadly available public liberal arts education which prepares leaders to safeguard the rights of others to combat degeneracy and to improve society, all in the inspiring setting of an academical village of magnificent design and beauty. We wanted someone who well understood and would advance the principles on which this university was established. Excellence in teaching, learning and research, open and robust inquiry, honor, integrity, civility, citizenship, public service, leadership development, and student self-governance. We found in Ms. Sullivan all of these qualities and much more. We wanted an experienced leader who could create a vision for the future that could be measurably achieved by aligned and motivated colleagues. We wanted a recognized academic who grasped the significance and complexities of the non-academic aspects of the university. An empathetic and emotionally intelligent person who was dedicated to our students, staff, faculty, alumni, friends, and community. And among many other desired attributes, we wanted someone who could effectively and persuasively advance the interests of the university in all appropriate forms. So comprehensive were our criteria that we wondered if finding such a person would be attainable. Remarkably, as many of you now know, Ms. Sullivan possesses all of these values, skills, abilities, and experiences. I would like to ask Douglas Laycock to come forward and join his wife as she is installed as the eighth president of the University of Virginia. It is my great pleasure to convey to Teresa Ann Sullivan the trust of the University of Virginia with full faith that she will lead our beloved institution with vision, wisdom, strength, compassion, and empathy. And now, Teresa, please raise your right hand and place your left hand on the Bible. By constitutional command, I ask, do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States in the state of Virginia, that you will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties incumbent upon you as president of the University of Virginia to the best of your ability, so help you God. I do. I now install you in the name of the rector and the board of visitors as president of the University of Virginia. I invest you with the authority and charge you with the responsibility pertaining to the office. Congratulations. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Governor McDonald, Rector Wynn, and members of the Board of Visitors, faculty, staff, students, parents, alumni, friends of the University of Virginia. Today, I formally dedicate my time, my energy, and my utmost effort to the presidency of this great university. I accept the task before me with gratitude and humility, and I face the future with hope and optimism for what we, together, will accomplish in the years ahead. The inauguration of a new university president tends to focus on the individual person assuming the presidency. But this occasion should focus our attention on the institution, its values and mission, its generative power in producing new knowledge and discoveries, its service for the common good, and its significance as a force for human betterment in the world. So after a few personal comments, I will deflect undue focus from me and turn these remarks where they belong to the university. I owe thanks to many people. I thank the rector and the visitors for their confidence in my abilities and I pledge to carry out the duties of this office with integrity and with steadfast attention to the university's core values. I'm deeply grateful to several people in the audience today whose guidance and personal friendship have shaped the course of my life. Mark Udoff, president of the University of California, who mentored me in administration at the University of Texas. Jay Westbrook, my long-term interdisciplinary writing partner, and his wife Polly, here from Austin. I'm grateful to Mary Sue Coleman for her kind remarks, and many members of her remarkable executive team are also here. I'm grateful to my colleagues here and elsewhere who have provided a scholarly family for me throughout my career four friends who were my undergraduate classmates at Michigan State are here, and four friends from my University of Chicago days. I'm very pleased that colleagues from Texas and from Michigan have come to grounds to celebrate with us. My Aunt Eleanor Finnegan has traveled here from Bremerton, Washington, and my cousins Jack and Judy Tumbleson from Rock Island, Illinois. My Finnegan cousins, Monica and her husband Mike Kelly from San Francisco, Ed and his wife Diane from Tacoma, and Anne from Bremerton have also traveled here to join us. I bring with me to this task my three greatest treasures. My husband, Doug Laycock, who teaches in the university's law school, and my two sons, Joseph Peter Laycock and John Patrick Laycock. As I begin my work as president, I am aware that I follow in the footsteps of strong leaders who have shaped this university over the past hundred years. John Castine served for the past 20 years. And Robert O'Neill, who is with us today, served for five years before that. These two men, and the five presidents who preceded them oversaw the evolution of this institution from a modest school of some regional renown to a truly global university and a model of excellence in American higher education. I am grateful to these former presidents for the strong foundation on which we stand. Earlier this week, we celebrated Founders Day to honor the birth of this university's mastermind, Thomas Jefferson, born on April 13, 1743. 
When he was a young man, Jefferson conceived a framework for a new republic based on a set of inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These potent words in the American Declaration of Independence gave us new language for the expression of individual human rights and universal liberties. And they gave us a moral standard for the newborn nation. When he was an old man, as the nation was approaching its half century mark, Jefferson shaped a plan for the University of Virginia that was as revolutionary as the truths he had expressed to define a free people. He designed this university to be radically different from other universities that existed at the time. Its curriculum, rather than focusing on a few constrained areas of specialization, would, in Jefferson's words, be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind to explore and to expose every subject susceptible of its contemplation. Unlike other universities at that time, this university would not conform to a particular religious doctrine. Jefferson used an architectural message to drive this point home. At the focal point of the academical village, Jefferson placed a library, the rotunda behind you, rather than the chapel that stood at the center of most American universities at the time. This was a sign that learning here would be limited by no dogma or doctrine, but only by the capacities of the human mind. Jefferson created this university to meet a pressing need. In the early 1800s, the United States was still in its infancy and the future of the Republic was by no means guaranteed. External threats and internal bickering had put the young nation's long-term prospects at risk. America would need strong leaders to sustain the fragile nation. As President Coleman remarked a few moments ago, Jefferson and his colleagues understood that a healthy democracy would require an educated citizenry. Jefferson believed then, as we believe today, that educated people led by enlightened leaders would provide the surest means of preserving hard-won freedoms. Equipping free people with useful knowledge would give them the tools necessary to resist tyranny and sustain democracy. Knowing these things, Jefferson built this university as a training ground for leaders of the American Republic. These two bold experiments, the American Republic and the University of Virginia, were connected at the very beginning. They remain connected now. They share a close and prolonged association of mutual benefit. Their relationship was symbiotic then, and it is symbiotic now. Like Jefferson, we live in revolutionary times. The revolution led by Jefferson and his collaborators was a political and military revolution played out in Independence Hall and at Lexington and Concord, at Bunker Hill and Valley Forge and Guilford Courthouse, at Yorktown and other battlefields where patriots fought and died to secure their freedom and ours. Our revolution is a knowledge revolution playing out in classrooms, laboratories, and libraries around the world. The frictions of time and space have been forever altered. In this new revolution, technological advances have obliterated barriers to information sharing, made distance largely irrelevant, and opened new pathways to collaboration across disciplines. The pace of discovery and the pace of disseminating information have quickened beyond anything Mr. Jefferson could have imagined. The volume of information grows exponentially. Our new observational abilities provide us with unprecedented quantities of data. We gaze outward with powerful telescopes into the farthest reaches of the universe and inward with powerful microscopes 
to sub-nano and pico levels. Developments in imaging illuminate what was previously opaque. The new sources of data spur us on to develop new forms of data storage and management. Our ever-expanding capacity to store data preserves much that would previously have been discarded and challenges our ability to organize and process our data. We struggle to find new and more robust approaches to data reduction and analysis and new approaches to structural modeling. This knowledge revolution has accelerated productivity. With an economy based more on knowledge and less on natural resources and manufacturing, we produce more of everything with fewer workers. Just as the improvement in agricultural productivity freed up workers for the newly industrialized cities, today the great improvement in manufacturing productivity frees up workers for newer occupations based on technology and knowledge. We don't know with any certainty what many of those occupations will be, but we do know that some of these new occupations will in turn quickly morph into whole new fields and occupations. I ask now that you consider these two revolutions together. Hold them side by side in your mind. The political and military revolution that began 235 years ago and gave us our national independence and the knowledge revolution that is transforming cultures and economies today. They are worth comparing because the stakes were so high then and the stakes are so high now. The new revolution challenges our society in every way. It challenges us technologically. We need an educated workforce that can operate and manage the new technology, continue to improve it and develop it, and ensure that we control the technology rather than letting the technology control us. The new revolution challenges us economically. Important industries are declining or dying. Here in Virginia, we have seen the loss of textiles, furniture, metalworking, and other traditional industries. Geographical distance no longer offers much protection from economic competition from countries with lower labor costs. Meanwhile, new industries are emerging here and elsewhere, and more must emerge. The new revolution challenges us politically. Our political system must respond effectively to the extraordinary pace of change, and it must function despite the challenges created by hyperpartisan blogs and television commentators in the 24-hour news cycle, all made possible by new and ever cheaper information technology. And the new revolution challenges us philosophically. When we have more information at our fingertips than we could possibly absorb in a lifetime, when our information devices present us with continuous short-term distractions and disrupt our capacity for serious thought, when computers easily defeat our greatest champions in chess and on the television quiz show Jeopardy, when all of this is happening, it is more important than ever to think about what it means to be human and what it means to lead the good life. We are not responding to these challenges as well as we should. The United States is falling behind other developed nations in the number of men and women earning college degrees, and especially those who earn degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM disciplines that allow us to keep pace with technological advances. Just as education was an essential precondition for citizens to be able to operate the new governing structure created in that first revolution, so dominance in education today is the key to national security and economic competitiveness. Educational failure in that first revolution would have imperiled our nation then. Educational failure in today's revolution will imperil our nation now. More and better education in the STEM disciplines is essential in responding to the technological challenge. More and better education in all disciplines is essential in responding to the whole range of challenges. 
technological, economic, political, and philosophic. The American Revolution that led to independence from the British Empire required strong leaders. Leaders such as Jefferson, Washington, Madison, Hamilton, and many others. This new revolution will require strong leaders, too. Who will those leaders be? Who will train them? We have many fine universities in this country, both public and private. Many of them have representatives with us today. Some are larger than UVA. Some are older than UVA. Some sit higher in the popular rankings. The revolution we face requires that all these great universities continue to flourish, that they all get adequate political and financial support, that they all do their part to train the next generation. But I propose to you that among all these universities, this university is especially well suited to prepare young people to face the challenges of our revolution unique qualities that influence how students live and learn at this university help us train effective and ethical leaders who can respond to the political challenges of the new revolution. Student life here combines academic learning with practical training in honor, ethics, self-governance, and leadership. From their first day on the grounds, students begin to absorb these values. Because of the honor system, students are trusted in their academic behavior. In exchange for being trusted, they take a pledge against lying, cheating, and stealing. Students take responsibility for themselves and for each other. They trust students who come from very different backgrounds than their own. Honor and personal accountability shape student self-governance and extend to virtually every aspect of student life. An appreciation for diversity prepares students for life in a globalized society. Strong moral values provide an anchor in tough times. Strong academic values provide a sure foundation for the intellect. Revolutionary though he was, Jefferson also knew that universities must conserve what we already know. Pavilion 5 was first inhabited by a professor of ancient languages and Pavilion 9 by a professor of moral philosophy, a term that in Jefferson's day included ethics, rhetoric, and philosophy. Ancient languages philosophy, literature, and history link today's students to their intellectual heritage. This university's strong curriculum in humanities and the arts prepares students to address the philosophical challenge of the new revolution. This curriculum must always be central to the university's mission. At the same time, we nurture curiosity and discovery in all fields. We are proud to be a research university because research enables the faculty to continue to learn, because research enables the faculty to contribute new knowledge to the larger society, and because research skills are an important tool we can impart to each student, whether that student be seeking an undergraduate, graduate, or professional degree. The academical village remains an important metaphor for the distinctive approach to learning that has characterized these grounds. Students and faculty live and work side by side in the shared pursuit of knowledge. The first floors of the pavilions were the original classrooms where faculty members and their student neighbors came together to learn. But there is a second floor to each pavilion where the professors lived. And between the pavilions at the second story level, there is a walkway. 
that walkway permitted the professor of one field to stroll over for a conversation with a neighboring professor of another field. The secret to a great university is the second story, where the faculty live and study and where new ideas, even new fields, grow in the spaces between the disciplines. Consider two of our faculty, Brett Blackman from engineering and Brian Wamhoff from medicine. They took that walk on the second story to collaborate. Understanding that living human cells can be used to test cardiovascular drugs, they developed a new instrument that detects the genomic response of human blood cells to new drugs. This instrument offered a way to screen new drugs much more accurately and inexpensively than before. With support from the Coulter Foundation UVA Translational Research Partnership, they started a company called Hemoshear to produce the instrument here in Charlottesville. Since 2009, Hemoshear has generated 15 jobs, including jobs for several recent UVA graduates. This new knowledge created jobs and tax revenues, but most important, it improves health care. This is one example of many. The future vitality of the university is nurtured in these second story walks. We must keep the vibrant activity of the first story classrooms and the close interactions between students and faculty while nurturing the creative and visionary activity stimulated on the second story walkway that connects the disciplines. I reject the canard that research is incompatible with a great undergraduate education. That claim is grounded in a static and fundamentally underachieving approach to our students' abilities. To the contrary, the creative ferment within a community of learners intensifies and sharpens the critical thinking of all. Our society desperately needs leaders with such a vibrant intellectual capacity. And it needs leaders who have the strong values that characterize the UVA education. Many Americans are discouraged by the current condition of our democratic project. We see gridlock in Congress. We hear partisan bickering among our elected officials. All across the country, we see competing interests looking to gain the upper hand rather than looking to find common ground. We hear cynicism about the role of money in politics. Part of our political challenge is to find leaders with the integrity and resolve to help us rise above this fray. Now, as Jefferson said nearly 200 years ago at our founding, the university is an institution on which the fortunes of our country may depend. And our founding purpose remains our first order of business today. We prepare students to safeguard the fortunes of our country and lead it into the future. Today, we prepare students to meet the political, economic, technological, and philosophical challenges of our new revolution. I've spoken a lot about Thomas Jefferson in the last few minutes. But we cannot afford to dwell too long on the university's history because we have such a critical role to play now in the 21st century. Jefferson himself wrote, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. He would not want us to spend all our energies reflecting on past glories. Instead, we should face forward and try to emulate our founders' best qualities, the insatiability of his inquiring mind his restlessness with the status quo, his insistence on making knowledge useful, his dedication to the public good, his steadfast attention to the future. With our gaze cast toward the future, let's commit ourselves to rearticulating Mr. Jefferson's founding ideals in these modern times. Let's acknowledge that this university has an essential role to play in our nation's future. And let's vow to work hard together as we embrace that responsibility. Many colleges and universities from across the nation are represented here today. All of us are engaged in the important work of discovering, preserving, and disseminating knowledge. 
As president of this university, I look forward to joining forces with my colleagues in higher education to pursue our shared mission and our common purpose. As I take on the responsibilities of this presidency, I carry forward the work begun by my predecessors. More than 100 years ago, another inauguration took place here when Edwin Alderman was installed as the university's very first president. In his inaugural address, address President Alderman spoke about the founding of the university and the necessity of sustaining it for future generations. He had these words to say. This university faces, faces the future, which summons you and me to preserve and strengthen as it summoned the founders to conceive and create. With the help of my colleagues, I will preserve and strengthen this university to the best of my ability. I am aware that doing this work is both a privilege and an obligation. The obligation extends back in time to the day in 1817 when Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe laid the university's first cornerstone. And forward in time to future generations who will come here to learn. I am grateful for the privilege of serving. And I will work hard to meet the demands of the obligation. Thank you, official President Sullivan. Please join us for a reception in honor of our new president. And the reception is located in the area between the University Chapel and the Rotunda. It may be the largest birthday party her husband has ever had. Happy birthday, Doug. The University Singers will now perform Virginia Hail All Hail and will be joined by the University of Virginia Band for the good old song. There will be a limited recession of the platform party, members of the Board of Visitors, Vice Presidents and Deans. Please stay in place until the President's party has reached the second tier of the lawn. Thank you all for coming.
That's the only ones I've found, but I'll keep my eye open if I find anything else.